Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's house this morning. It's a pleasure to see you all gathered together once again in God's house today. And as we hear from the word of God proclaimed to us today, we do have to get into some weightier matters of life and death and the meaning of existence. As our Lord says, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions or worldly wealth, because if you end it without being rich toward God, God reminds us that he can take any of those things away from us at any moment. So as it is, our treasure is in heaven. And the preacher in Ecclesiastes comes to the same conclusion as Jesus, that death makes life meaningless. But God gives life true meaning. As we'll see in God's word today, true meaning, as well as true treasure, comes from God. True treasure will, comes from God will be the theme for our service this morning. We'll begin that service with the opening hymn I'll printed in your service folder. What is the world to me? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. 
But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us graciously. Amen. Sermon 
A reading from Ecclesiastes chapters 1 and 2. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. Chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they have control over all the fruit of my toil, into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This, too, is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This, too, is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This, too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This, too, is meaningless. Chasing after the wind. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll recite Psalm 90 responsibly as indicated in your service. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn the people back to dust, and you return to dust in your A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. Or like a watch in the night. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Since God has raised you with Christ in your baptism, God calls you to live no longer for the pleasures of this world or your sinful nature, but to live with Christ. I'm reading from Colossians chapter 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you die. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Ghost. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where are your treasures? There your heart will be also. Alleluia. The Gospel according to the book of Luke, chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. 
Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. The Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified in the conscious pilot, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand of the he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day. Greedy, stingy old lawyer 
who wanted to disprove the saying that you can't take it with you when you die. So as he stood on death's doorway, he instructed his wife to withdraw large stacks of cash from their bank account and to stuff them to the brim in pillowcases where she would store them in the attic. His reasoning? As he ascended up to heaven, he would grab those pillowcases on his way out of this world. Now, maybe you've also heard the rest of that joke. Months later, after his departure, when his wife was cleaning out the attic, she found those forgotten pillowcases and said to herself, I told him he should have put these in the basement. No. Not to knock on lawyers or anybody who may be listening today, that's not hardly the point, but as we turn our minds to much weightier and heavier matters, matters of life and death and the meaning of life and death. That little anecdote reflects an important truth that's also observed by the preacher, or teacher as he's called in our text. You can't take it with you when you die. Nothing, your money, your possessions, all that you've got won't do you any good when you get to the end of this life. So then what's the point? What's it all about? Is it truly, as it says, meaningless, utterly meaningless? Well, God's word, as our guide today tells us, the true treasure comes from God, who alone can give our life. Maybe it seems like what we just said contradicts what the teacher, or preacher, as he's properly called in the original language, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, said just moments ago, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. How can a believer in God say that? How can someone writing under divine inspiration say that life itself is completely devoid of any and all meaning. Maybe we need to back ourselves up and see how this preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, got to that conclusion. Context brought him there. Maybe you thought, Pastor, you're supposed to tell us how life has great meaning. Well, what brought the preacher to this conclusion? He tells us he set his mind, his intellect, his wisdom to observing everything and every activity that goes on under the sky, under the heavens. Everything that people do. And with an intellect and mind and reasoning that would rival the greatest thinkers of all time. People like Socrates and Plato, Einstein and the rest. He came to the conclusion that our work is just a burden that all of it is burdening us. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. Where did he get that? What are we working for? What's the point in life under the sun, the observable universe that you and I can see with our eyes? He says it's in a word Meaningless. Literally, that word means breath or vapor. Trying to find some reason for existence or some greater purpose in this universe is as futile and fleeting as trying to grab a hold of your breath as it escapes your mouth. It says meaningless. It's trying to capture the wind. No sooner do you feel it than it's gone. That, in short, sums up the entirety of human existence. Futile, fleeting. We live, we die. As much as we might try to push against that nihilistic view of things, we live in a world that likes to tell us that your purpose in life is whatever you determine it to be, that you can make your own meaning out of life. And suppose there's a sprinkle of truth to that statement, that you tend to get more out of life when you put more in it. 
What good does that splash do against the ocean of meaninglessness? Because even if you created some great and wonderful purpose for yourself, at the end of life, didn't you end it the same as everyone else? So what's the point? What are we working for? We live in a world that loves to tell you that whoever ends life with the most stuff wins. But the preacher in our text says exactly the opposite. He said he began to hate all the stuff he had at the end of life. Why? What good did it do him? When he ended his life, he'd have to pass it on to somebody else, and everything that he had worked so hard to accomplish would go to somebody else who didn't work for it. God only knew what he would do with it. Whether that person would be wise or foolish, build up that establishment or tear down everything he had accomplished. What's the point? What's the point of having all that stuff? What's the point in having great money, material goods? It's another fascinating thing. We live in a world that tells us that money can't buy happiness. But at the same time, what do most people say will make them happy? You guess the number one answer? Survey says it's money. Run, is it? And then how much money is ever enough to truly satisfy? How much earthly possessions do you need before you've got quite enough? What good does it get you at the end of the day? Sure, money can buy you great things. You need money to buy food. Money can buy you conveniences that make your life easier. But when you come to the end of life, what difference does it make if you had an abundance of wealth or if you slaved away in a third world country for each and every meal you ever ate? What good does it all do? Death makes money meaningless. Because it doesn't do you any good after you die. And if it's not money that we're working for, then what do we work for? If you're not just going to work to get a paycheck, then what's the point? Maybe that's the song of our day as much as everything, as the preacher says it quite crystal clear. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain, even at night. Their minds do not rest. We modern people of the 21st century have progressed so far beyond our ancestors that we no longer send children and youth to sweatshops to labor away and die of exhaustion. Oh no, we're so much better. We work at jobs that leave us with panic and anxiety when we go home. And they eat us away, hour after hour, and they prevent us from sleeping. They give people panic attacks and ulcers. And our work is literally killing us. So what's the point? That's not said to make light of serious mental illnesses that need help, like anxiety and depression and other disorders. In fact, just the opposite. All those things going on in our world today, don't they just prove exactly what God is saying here? Don't they highlight and underscore what he's already told us? Meaning. Death makes all that work meaningless. Because what do you get out of it? At the end of the day, you're still dead. And the preacher here tells us he began to despair because nothing mattered. Nothing he did matter. But already here, in these words, there's something that points us to something greater, something that God had said long before the preacher ruled as king in Jerusalem. And they said all the way in the garden. As he hits on a profound truth here, 
What do people get for all their toil and anxious striving? It's meant to remind us of what God said to our very first parents in that time. It's already implicit in the way that the preacher calls humanity or mankind the original sons of Adam, sons of mankind, that we inherited from our first parents a sinful nature which brought a curse upon this world as God himself spoke that curse through painful toil you will eat by the spread of sweat of your brow. The dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That's the point. Work so hard, and we've only contributed and perpetuated the sin that our parents brought into this world. Because from them we inherited that same sinful nature that takes all the good things that God gives us and ruins them. You see it already in the things we've listed. The gift of money that God gives us to serve Him. How do we use it? Do we ever use it to serve ourselves first? Rather than, even if it's not percentage-wise, to use it first for God and to give him his portion above all others, before then using what he's given us to serve the people he's put in our lives? Or do we labor all our lives after money so that we can have money for its own benefit? As though this is somehow some great legacy that we can pass on, even though it's not going to last beyond this world. We see it in the gift that God gives in work. Maybe we don't bow down to slips of green paper called cash or to our paychecks. Who among us here hasn't missed worship because of work? Where do our true priorities lie? Who's our true God? We work so hard for what? We work too much, we work too little. We work at all the wrong things rather than what God would have us work for. And even the good that is rest, where do we find our rest? We rest when we should be working and work when we should be resting. Do we find rest in God's word where he has promised to give us rest by the words of our Savior Jesus? Do we find rest in anything and everything other than where he promises to be? All these things really just serve as evidence that we truly have contributed, that this is our fault, that this curse has come upon the world. And in the observable universe, death renders everything meaningless. That's the point under the observable world that human beings can reason out for themselves. All we can do is scratch our heads and wonder, what's the point? We live and we die. None of us can figure it out on our own. But thankfully God didn't leave us scratching our heads and wondering what purpose there could be. But God told us. God, who created mankind in the first place, who breathed the breath of life into Adam. He gave us purpose when he created us. He gives us true purpose to this day, because God gives us true treasure. The true treasure comes from God, who alone is our true treasure. Because he gives us Jesus. Now, even the preacher recognized that true treasure comes from God. As he himself said, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their work, in their labor. This is from the hand of God. That God gives true treasure. It comes from him. True rest and meaning comes from God alone. But what's more fascinating is not that God is what's truly valuable, as is right. But 
that God shows us what he truly meant by showing us what he was willing to pay for. That's, that's an argument that's out there in the market today, that an item is worth to you whatever you're willing to pay for it, and we don't have time in a brief discussion to explain all the reasons why that kind of thinking is wrong. But God did that. He showed us what was truly valuable to him by showing us what he was willing to pay for. As God himself breathed new life into humanity by becoming one of us. And our Savior Jesus, born in Bethlehem, placed in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. But God gives new purpose, new meaning, and something far greater, true treasure to humanity. He shows us what he valued above all else by showing what he was willing to to pay, that you are his true treasure. And for you, he left the luxury of heaven to walk this earth. Thank God, by right. No home to lay his head, no bed, but someone who recognized God's gifts exactly as they are. Gifts from God. Whether that's money, earthly possessions, human relationships, you name it, he practiced what he preached. This preacher showed us what was valuable to him. And he gave his life for us. Not just so that we could have some new, more purposeful meaning to our lives. That comes as, an, as a consequence of that, too. So that he could give us the greatest gift of all our true treasure in Christ. And along with him, the gift of eternal life, forgiveness of sins, salvation. All good gifts that come from him. Our Savior Jesus gave his life to show us just what he treasured above all. You, me. And our Savior Jesus breathed new life into us. When he came to us, when we first believed. That became yours, then and there. As at your baptism, God declared you his child, his heir. And now he says all the wealth of the nations belongs to you who please God. It says in another place, without faith it is impossible to please God. You who trust that Jesus paid for all your sins, when we see that Jesus is the true purpose for which we are created. To you he gives the wealth of the nations, natural resources, money, and all the rest. And suppose someone will say, if God gives the wealth of the nations to you and to me, where's my paycheck? Well, first of all, as 21st century Americans, almost all of us undoubtedly, are wealthy beyond the wildest dreams of this world. More than that. God never promises to make you wealthy in the terms of this world, but true treasure comes from God. He gives all these gifts, wealth and possessions and everything else, as gifts from his hand to be received with joy and thanksgiving and to be used in a way that pleases him. Out of thanks for all he's done. But he gives you exactly what you need, not necessarily what you want what's good for you, so that he will keep you on the path to eternal life, and to remind you that true treasure comes from God alone. That your life consists more than just the abundance of earthly possessions and material goods. But since God has given the wealth of the nations back to us in all things along with our Savior Jesus, it changes not just the way we view the blessings he's given us in material goods, but even the way we see our work. It's no longer meaningless, but God has filled it with great meaning, as he promises again to the one who pleases God. He promises to give satisfaction. Maybe it doesn't seem all that satisfying to you, 
when you wash the dishes, when you do the laundry or clean up after children who, by rights, are old enough to clean up for themselves. But when this work is done out of thanks to God and love for Jesus, it pleases God and satisfies Him. And then this work can satisfy us too, knowing that we have done what is good and pleasing to our God, and that He loves us. Not because of merely what we've done, but because of Jesus. Maybe you work at a job that you don't enjoy going to, that you have to show up for because you need to live. But even that, when viewed out of thanks to God and love and concern for your fellow man is an opportunity for you and for me to serve God by giving our fullest and best to God and to our neighbor. And we can find satisfaction in work well done and in honest labor, knowing we are pleasing God. It's more than just that. See, you who are gathered here, you aren't just people who please God on Sunday morning and then go about the rest of your week. But you are Christians each and every moment of your life. That everything you do is to please God as his baptized and redeemed people. It gives great meaning to everything. You have the opportunity and the privilege as God's people to speak meaning to a world that sees no meaning to its existence. To tell them. True treasure comes from God. To tell them with your words, absolutely, and with what you do, your actions. Put those together and proclaim to people the forgiveness of sins and eternal life that comes from our Savior, Jesus. So everything is offered to God. So, no, you can't take your money with you when you die. But money by itself is a treasure to be received with thanksgiving from God. But our true treasure is Christ, who rules the world for the good of his church, and we set our hearts with him in heaven. True treasure comes from God. And maybe you work at a job you don't find particularly satisfying. But you serve our God, all of you. You can satisfy him in Jesus. True treasure that comes from God. While life under the S-U-N sun may be meaningless as far as human wisdom and reasoning can come to a conclusion. Life under God's S-O-N is filled with great meaning. And it lasts into eternity. Because of Jesus, it will never end. Amen. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Lord God, our creator and preserver, help us best to put to their use all the talents, abilities, creativity, imagination, and wealth that we have in service to you and your people. Preserve us from apathy, complacency, and selfishness. Keep us from so actively pursuing prosperity or fame that in gaining the whole world we lose our soul. Lead us to use wisely, and for your glory all you have entrusted to our care. Make us always grateful for your generosity, and move us to share generously with others. And we join in the Lord's prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Our service continues on page 20 in your service folder with the section entitled Thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We have the privilege this morning of welcoming and installing as pastor here in Monroe, Pastor Paul Schutman. I'll ask him to come forward at this time. Pastor Paul, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, said to his church, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. In his great love, our risen and ascended Lord has established the gospel ministry and promises to provide his church with qualified servants to lead his people in carrying out this commission. St. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Christ ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Dear brother, the Lord Jesus and this congregation have called you to serve in the pastoral ministry. It is good for you to hear the Lord's will concerning this calling. St. Paul wrote that a pastor must be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. He must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Paul urged Timothy to set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. He further advised him, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. The Apostle gave these additional words of encouragement. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. In all your tasks and responsibilities, our Lord Jesus equips you with the gospel of the forgiveness of sins, the gift that makes you truly competent as a servant of Christ, St. Paul wrote, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. In keeping with the word and will of the Lord, I ask you before God and his people, do you believe that the canonical books of the Old and New Testament are the inspired word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice? I do. Do you accept the three ecumenical creeds, the Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian because they are faithful testimonies to the truth of the Holy Scriptures? And do you reject all the errors that they condemn? I do. Do you accept the unaltered Augsburg Confession along with the other confessions in the Book of Concord? The Apology of the Augsburg Confession, the Small and Large Catechisms of Martin Luther, the Small Called Articles, and the Formula of Concord, because they are true expositions of the Word of God and correct presentations of the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? I do. Do you solemnly promise that all your teaching and your administration of the sacraments will conform to the Holy Scriptures and the Lutheran Confessions? I do. Are you willing to carry out the work entrusted to you according to the grace that God gives? I do what I ask that to help. Will you endeavor to live a life that reflects the love God has for you so that all may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven? I will and I ask that to help. The Almighty God, who has given you the desire to do these things, graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. Brothers and sisters of resurrection, you have heard the promises spoken by the pastor you have called. I encourage you to receive him with joy, 
And remember what the Word of God calls you to do. Listen eagerly to the preaching of the Word and receive it not as the Word of men, but as the Word of God, working together with Him for the Lord's kingdom, so that your shared service may, be, may bring spiritual blessings to the Savior's people. Keep Him and His work in your prayers, so that His ministry may be blessed, and that He may carry out His work with joy. Provide for his physical needs, for the Savior said, The worker deserves his wages. Honor and love him, as St. Paul urged. Acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love because of their work. I now ask you, the brothers and sisters of resurrection, are you willing to receive your pastor as a servant of Christ? Will you show him love and honor and support him with your gifts and prayers? The Almighty and merciful God strengthen you to do what you have promised. Paul Schutman, I install you as pastor at Resurrection Lutheran Church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord pour out on you his Holy Spirit for the work you have been called to do, that you may care faithfully carry out all your duties and responsibilities with the Word of God as your confidence and guide. Let us pray. Lord God, gracious Father, you sent pastors to serve your people in the ministry of the gospel. Fill your servant with your Holy Spirit that he may carry out this ministry despite his weaknesses and faults. Lead and guide him with your power and love. Encourage him as he proclaims the word and administers the sacraments. And make him a blessing to all those he serves. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go then, dear brother, and take up the work to which you have been called. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in you what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Welcome, brother. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. As we conclude our service, we're going to sing the closing verses of our uh, distribution hymn. We'll sing the final three stanzas of All Depends on Our Possessors. 